the many government officials who are present here and whom I have had the honor of meeting yesterday, uh, the Minister for Defense, those in the Ministry of Education, uh, those young men who are running Sonyo, and of course the leaders of the opposition, and distinguished ladies and gentlemen who have assembled here this early morning for us to share in some of the initiatives that we are undertaking as our modest contribution to the continent of Africa and what the great politician of your country, Abdul Kadin Jirde, has described as the African way. Just this morning, I was listening uh, to a speech uh, delivered by the former President of the United Republic of Tanzania, uh, the late Benjamin William Kaka. And what impressed me about the statement of Benjamin William Kaka is his recognition and his reminder to his audience on that day that God in his divine wisdom creates people differently. Some he creates tall, some he creates short, some he creates big, some small. But the diversity is indeed the essence of God's creation. And just this morning, when I listened to the grand old man, Zejirde, he reminded us that Africa has become a marketplace of foreign ideas, which we as Africans including those who are scholars and those who are in different parts of African governments market as if they were God-given. You visit African universities and they talk about the Washington Consensus, he said. We talk about the Beijing Consensus, he said. We talk about the European way, he said. We talk about the Turkish model, but we never talk about the African model or the African way. And that is the tragedy of Africa. We have lamented it about, it about it for long. We have criticized it for long. We have debated it for long. And I think the time is now that we must do something about it. We must do something about it by ensuring that our words are positive words that encourage rather than negative words that paralyze. We must do something about it in a manner that raises our enthusiasm rather than dampens our spirit. We have been told this morning the, the great little country of Somaliland has a population, 75% of whom are below the age of 35. Those young men and women are looking for opportunities. They are looking for opportunities for employment. They are looking for opportunities to invent and to innovate. And they are looking to governments to create those opportunities. And we have witnessed in the recent past when young Africans don't have opportunities, then they go to embassies of foreign countries to be abused and to be humiliated. We have seen recently young Africans 
drawn from different parts of the continent, being abused and humiliated in Europe. We have seen them being abused and humiliated in the United States of America. We have seen them being abused and humiliated in the Arab world because we in the continent have not created opportunities. And the time is now, therefore, for all of us who are of African descent to ask ourselves again the questions that were asked by our forebearers 60 years ago. Because when I listen to history and I read history, there is nothing new that we are saying. There is nothing new that we are saying that Nyerere did not say in 1960. There is nothing new that we are saying that Nkrumah did not say in 1963. There is nothing new that we are saying that Samora Marshall did not say in 1970. There is nothing new that we are saying that Patrice Emery Lumumba did not say in 1961. But we repeat them because we have not done what we ought to have done. I hear so very eloquently as early as 1951, the great men of Africa saying, let us give education to our young men and women that they may fight ignorance. 60 years down the line, Many African countries cannot feed themselves. Yet we have graduates in agriculture in the tens of thousands. I hear them telling us that when we regain independence, we shall be able to make our medicines. We shall no longer rely on Europe or America, but everywhere you go, even in this era of COVID, the vaccines that we are receiving, none of them comes from the continent of Africa. We do not know what they are, but we consume them nevertheless. When they tell us it's Johnson and Johnson, we say it is Johnson and Johnson. When they tell us it's AstraZeneca, we say it is AstraZeneca. When they tell us it is Moderna, we say it is Moderna. We do not know the difference between Moderna, AstraZeneca, and Johnson & Johnson. We simply say they are because we are told they are. Which begs the question, what kind of education have we received? We have in the last many years produced thousands of engineers. But yet when I travel across the continent of Africa, I do not see our Africans doing the great engineering works. All I see are Chinese. I see those Chinese in every other African capital, which begs the question, what kind of engineering do we teach in our universities? When I travel across the continent of Africa, even in this assembly, I see all of you with mobile phones. But I've never seen a mobile phone produced by any other African country. Either the mobile phone is produced by the Koreans, or the Chinese, or the Canadians, or the Americans, or the Finns, there is no African mobile phone. And I ask myself, when will Africa produce our own? When I, last evening, traveled on the roads of Harge Issa, as I've done in many African countries, I see cars and traffic jams. But there is not a single African country in the last 60 years that has produced a car. And I ask, 
What kind of engineering do we teach in our universities? Right now, I see cameras from television and radio stations, including the microphone that I hold. None of them is made in the continent of Africa. That is the tragedy of our continent. We lament about how on a daily basis, before I stood up, I was provided with a bottle of water, and that bottle of water is Dasani made by Coca-Cola in the United States of America. Even water, we do not consume our own. That is the tragedy of the continent in which we live. As I sit here, and I'm making it simple and basic, the gentlemen are wearing leather shoes. We have enough cows and enough hides and skins, but I dare say that 99% of the shoes that is being worn by the men and women in this assembly is from Europe and America. That is the tragedy. That is the Africa that we talk about. It is that Africa that we must change. And change we can, but we must make a resolve to make that change. Why is it, I often ask, that a few years ago, there are few of us here alive who are there when in 1945, Germany was bombed to the ground. Today, it is a world power in science and technology. What happened that they rose from the fire of extinction to the hard ground of reality and discovery? What did they do? There is not an army of angels that descended upon Germany to do the building, no. They took a solemn vow that they'll change their circumstances. Can we Africans do that? In 1953, Korea was involved in war and they destroyed each other. Today, if you walk into any television station, there is an equipment in the sector that comes from Korea in the name of Samsung. Turkey, until very recently, was a country that was not known for much except our history. Today, if you want to buy an iron box, Ramptons is from Turkey. Can we Africans do that? You know, whether you read the Holy Quran, or you read the Christian Bible, or the Jewish Torah, all the Hindu Vedas, the divine instruction is that you go out there and subdue the world. How have we subdued the world, we of the African continent? The world has subdued us. That is why we still import things that we can make for ourselves. In the words of the great Kenyan, professor and thinker Ali Mazrui, Africa produces what it does not consume and consumes what it does not produce. That is what we want to change and change it we can, particularly if we invest in our young men and women. You know, several years ago, I listened to the great Nelson Mandela and he said that part of the problem of Africa is the assumption that she can grow without involving her women in growth. And he said, how can you have two hands and tie one and expect that you will function in the same way? Africa has held our women down for too long. The time is now to release the potential of our women. Africa has held our hand down because she has denied her young people the opportunity to thrive and to survive and to deliver. The time is now that the potential of the 75% that are to be found here in Somaliland and to be found in Africa must be unleashed. 
Because if it is not, then we will not subdue the world. The time is now for Africa to wake up. And the time is now for each one of us in this assembly to ask the question, what am I doing about it? You know, it is very easy to blame others. It is very easy to say that it is those in government who must do it, and they should do it because they collect our taxes. But it is also your duty to make a contribution by making demands of those whom you give the honor and privilege of serving you. And if they don't serve you, you remove them via the ballot. And I'm very happy that here in Somaliland, you do it so very peacefully, unlike many African countries. You know, Two weeks ago, I had the honor and privilege of watching a documentary. It was a documentary that was made by a Kenyan journalist. And he stood in the streets of Hargeisa. And there was a lot of money in the streets being sold. The money was there. And he reported that in Hargeisa, when the Remuezin calls for prayer, people leave their money and they still come back and find it. And I said, let them try it only in Hargeisha. If they try it elsewhere in Africa, they'll never find their money. <laughs> I, what I'm saying is that there is something that Africa can learn from Somaliland. There is something that Africa can learn from Somaliland that even without resources, you can still make something out of little. That you can run things in a transparent manner and that you can run a government with little resources and still deliver to your people. There is something that we can learn from Somaliland. And I'm suggesting that if we can learn something from Somaliland, it is possible that Africa and Africans can learn from Africans. And when we talk about the African way, we never ever say that Africa is going to shut herself out. No, we simply are saying that we are going to do what is necessary. What is good in America, we shall borrow it. What is good in the United Kingdom, we shall borrow it. What is good in Turkey, we shall borrow it. What is good in China, we shall borrow it, but we shall give it an African flavor. And that is what we are doing, that is what we are doing here by bringing Unity University because we are very deliberate in our recognition that part of the problem of the African continent is our disunity. Africa is disrespected because she is disunited. The day that Africa unites, the day that Africa chooses to do things in a coordinated way, that is the day the world will begin to respect Africa. You know, many times I think about this continent and I think about how often I think about our 1.4 billion young men and women, and I think about our 54 countries that were artificially created by the Europeans in 1884. I think about our resources. I think about the gold that is to be found in Ghana. I think about how that gold is traded in London, not in Accra. I think about the coltan that is to be found in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And I know how that coltan is traded in Beijing. I think about cocoa in La Côte d'Ivoire. And I see how that cocoa is turned into chocolate in Switzerland, which does not produce even a single bush of cocoa. 
I think about tea that is produced in Kenya and I see the British without a single bush of tea claiming that they have something called the English tea. I think about the coffee that is generated in Ethiopia and in Kenya and in Uganda and I see dormants in the United States of America saying that they have coffee. I think about the cotton that is produced in Egypt and I know that if we choose to add value to the things that we produce, Africa can be great. But she's not going to be great because we give great lectures, no. Africa is not going to be great because we say that she should be great. Africa is going to be great when her young sons and daughters roll up their sleeves and they do something about it. You know, the Igbo in Nigeria have a beautiful say that if you think you can shake a big tree, the only thing you end up shaking is are your buttocks. And there is wisdom in that say. If we want to shake a big tree, we must all join our hands together. And it's only in joining our hands together that we shall make Africa great again. Because there was a time when Africa was great. And if you want to be romantic about history, you can go to Egypt of old, you can go to Lalibela in Ethiopia, you can go to the Monomotapa Empire in Zimbabwe, you can go to Benin in Nigeria, but being great in the past means nothing if we are suffering now. So let us celebrate our history, but let us make our present great. And that is what brings me to the initiative that we are involved in here. The initiative whose agenda is to plant a seed, a seed of education which will, in the fullness of time, eliminate ignorance. I was talking to a friend of mine who is here in Hargeisa, I'll not name him so that you may not recognize him. But he was telling me that when his factory breaks down, he has to go to Dubai to bring somebody to repair things. How I wish that we could have technical education, that we have our own plumbers, that we have our own mechanics, that we have our own people who are capable of doing the things that we are inviting others to do. The question today, therefore, is, what are you going to do about it? You know, if you allow me to say this, I'm a juvenile student of Islam. And I want to conclude my submission by making reference to Islam. When the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, received the word, he went into the caves and historians will report to you that he was illiterate and that he saw something and he was told Ikra, read and the world has never been the same again. He was a man such as you and me divinely appointed to achieve a task what can you do if you believe in God? If you genuinely believe in God, can it not be done? That is the spirit that I'm asking you to embrace. When the prophet was expelled from Mecca, how many gods were resident at the Kaaba? Arab pagan gods. You will ask yourself and you will discover. And when the prophet 
moved to Medina. How many wars did he fight before he came back to Mecca? In one of the battles, I don't know whether it's the Battle of Uhud, he was outnumbered several times over. But he had resolved him and his Sahabas. He was a man such as you and me, instructed by God, and he believed that it could be done. I am visiting a country where in every hotel room they'll give you a direction showing you where the Qibla is. Ask yourself, at a practical level when you are looking at Mecca, in a practical sense, what should he do? Which God do the Chinese worship that we don't worship? Which one? If our God is God and is God, then we can do all these things. So ladies and gentlemen, mine to you is to join hands with us in unity, remembering always that it can be done and that it can only be done when we choose to do something about it. You know, Many times now, I'm a Christian by faith. But there is a brand of Christianity that has a mind in which I do not believe. A brand of Christianity which suggests to us that the things that require hard work will be realized through prayer only. You know, God is deliberate. God gave you wisdom to go and do certain things. So if you sit down as a prayerful person and you say, I'm going to pray that the Mansur Hotel will descend from heaven, it will never. You must take stone upon stone that you may build Mansur Hotel and God will help you in the process. If Africans believe that they'll pray that microphones will fall from heaven. No, it will not. We've got to work at it. So this belief that I see amongst African countries now, if you go to many African countries, there are many prayer sessions. People pray overnight in the belief that theology will solve their technological problems. No, theology is not in the business of solving your technological problem. It is universities that are going to do that. It is the governments that are going to do that by ensuring that you allocate research money to people to engage in research. So that if it is at Unity University or the University of Hargeisa, those of you who are in departments of education, you must give your intellectuals money so that they engage in research so that they can produce things that ought to be produced. I conclude by saying, the time has come that we must not import this from Saudi Arabia or from Dubai. Surely, must we do this? Must we? We who are here, the time has come that we must not import perfume from France. Surely, the time has come that we must do things for ourselves. The time has come and the time is now and it is you and me who must do it. Because sometimes, if I'm allowed a little imagination, on the day of judgment, God will ask us, what did you do while you are on earth? What will you say? While you are on earth, what will you do? What will you say you did? Say you tried to go to the United Kingdom, is that all you will say? Will you say that you tried to go to the United States of America? Is that all you'll say? I want you to say something different. Say that I tried. Say that I went to school and tried to improve agriculture. I went to school and I tried to improve the roads. I went to school and I tried to improve our circumstances. I went to school and I tried and Somaliland and Hargeisa are the richer because of me. God bless you.
هذا أو هذا أو كو هذا بشي أوردن تدبى دولار أو كلية كدر سو فرين كستو أدرتانا وكو بلاش استعمال شبكة دوغو بلارن جيجي سومالي لان هذا با سياد غش بطو أديقة كافية فضلان قراع حدق سديد إبر سديد أفرقيز أما حدق لبا إبر لبا أفرقيز تيو وطيلسوم 